Hi gang, Rob here. It is the afternoon of 19 January 2024. Coming to you this afternoon on a partly sunny 20 degree day in northeast Indiana. We got a little bit of snow overnight, but nothing to worry about unless you're the local school system. <laughs> so I'm coming on today with the first uh, of what I think will be a series of kind of uh, annual videos. I guess we'll call this one uh, something like the state of the knife market used January of 2024. <clears throat> this video's kind of been percolating in me for a few years, but I, I chose to make it now just to kind of share some information. And I think the market is kind of stabilized. <clears throat> so it doesn't have the volatility maybe that it had a year ago. But there have been some interesting changes over the last few years that I thought we should talk about. So why do I feel qualified to talk about this? Well, as most of you know, every week I do a knife sale video on Thursday night and I generally sell, you know, between 30 and 35 knives a week. So I don't know, 15 to 1700 knives a year, I guess I sell. And they're all used. They're almost all consignments, unless I'm selling some of my collection. So I spend a lot of time researching pricing, talking with my consigners about pricing, and then selling them to you guys uh, every Thursday night and through the weekends. And <clears throat> So I've seen some things happen, and I've got a feel for things, and I thought I would share that with you today. Before I do, let's do a pocket dump and a wrist check. For those of you who watched the uh, heads up sale video on Wednesday, you're going to recognize the knives. First, clip to the top of the left front pocket is the Benchmade 560 BK-1 Super Freak with a blade of Cerakoted CPM M4 black and gray layered milled G10 handle, red liners and standoffs. One of my absolute favorite modern folders in the world. In the bottom of the left front pocket today from the, the Tidiute line of Great Eastern Cutlery, the awesome 44 Magnum Gunstock or Buffalo Jack. Gabon ebony covers, hot dog shield, smooth nickel, silver bolsters and end caps. At least an eight pole, maybe an eight and a half. Big robust clip point main. Long usable pen blade with the Patty's Potato Peeler Etch. On the wrist today, from Citizen, it is the Promaster Fugu white dial on the bracelet. What a surprisingly awesome watch this has been. Anyway, <clears throat> well, let's get into it, shall we? I actually wrote some copy for this video. Uh... I may deviate and go on a couple rabbit trails as we go through it, but <clears throat> here you go. So first let's talk about general trends in the knife market. And this is again, primarily the pre-owned knife market, which I know a lot about. So first point, inflation and the fleeting desire for new steels every month by, uh, by a ravenous knife community have caused prices of all new knives to rise dramatically in the past three years. And I, I see it and I read it on social media. They're, you know, everybody's got their, their scapegoat brand that they like to talk about, you know. Chris Reeve knives have gotten ridiculously expensive. Everybody's got to pay the butterfly tax. <clears throat> well, it's true across the board, guys. Uh, second, since the used buyer is generally more frugal and discerning than the buyer of new knives, used values have not in general followed suit with the prices of new knives. So the used market hasn't risen price-wise, value-wise, with the prices of new knives. In fact, in most cases, the opposite is true. In fact, the used values of knives, third point, have actually seen great declines in sub, some segments of the market. If a knife isn't new, hot, and sold out, 
its used value will reflect significant depreciation. So once you get past the, the FOMO, right, the fear of missing out aspect of the new release market, for it to be of great value in the used market, it has to be iconic, rare, and highly sought after to bring premium money. Similarly, condition has become even more important in 2023 than ever. If your knife isn't near meant to like new in box, its value will take a significant hit. Okay, so those are the general trends. Now let's talk about <clears throat> used knife values or value trends by brand. And I've kind of picked the big ones, right? because I have a better feel for trends with brands who sell a lot of knives and especially brands who, whose knives I sell a lot of used. So first, <clears throat> this will not surprise you that I chose to talk about this brand first, if you know me, Benchmade. So <laughs> I wrote, even amongst all the quote unquote butterfly bashing, which seems to be a popular topic of conversation on social media, Benchmade values are still extremely strong, except for their least desirable models. And let's face it, Benchmade has released some clunkers, some turds over the years, and those knives don't bring good money. But <clears throat> let's just pick the easiest one to talk about, the legendary Benchmade 940. When I bought my first 940, gosh, 10 years ago, uh, it was an S30V new model that I bought from Derek at Knife Ship Free, and I think I paid $155, $160 for it. So I didn't look this up before I made the video, but I believe they're 207 map right now. Um, <clears throat> guess what? A used 940 with a couple scuffs in the aluminum that has good mechanics does 180 bucks. And there are hundreds of thousands of them out there. Um, <clears throat> still strong. I, uh, there you go. Benchmade makes great pocket knives. And when I get to the end of this video, we'll talk about sort of some of the intrinsic elements of value. And <clears throat> we'll talk about what makes a great pocket knife. Uh, next, Spyderco. <clears throat> now, this one has been a bit of a surprise to me. Other than one model, which really surprises me, and it's the Shaman, because I don't really love that knife. <clears throat> so other than the Shaman and all of its variants, Spyderco values have taken a slight tumble, and the feeding frenzy of, let's say, the late 20-teens and early 20-20s has definitely subsided. Uh, my best example of this is the Paramilitary too. Gone are the days when a Sprint Run or dealer-exclusive Para 2 will bring $250 to $350 a week after they sell out. <clears throat> I think this is because buyers have sort of learned that Spyderco releases about one of these Sprints or dealer-exclusive a month. Uh, so they won't have to wait for the next small batch run of paramilitary 2s. Now, there are exceptions to this. The old peel ply carbon fiber m4 pair two still do really good money and i think there's an m390 model that got run a few years ago that still does stupid money but usually <clears throat> yeah there's enough out there to go around still making great knives but they're not quite as strong in the used market as they were a few years ago next one zero tolerance <clears throat> And I wrote, the shine has definitely faded from the ZT star. I'm not sure if buyers have become more discerning or if ZT's 15 minutes of fame are over. Uh, it was more like 30, actually. <clears throat> but ZT values are in the toilet, except for a few select models. And I, I guess I would say those few select models would be, if you have a limited edition 392, Still worth a lot of money. <clears throat> 562 still do a lot of money. Some of the discontinued hinders like the 561s do pretty good. 
550s still do okay. Most ZTs, absolutely in the toilet. Why? Well, some of their older designs, especially the onion years and even the early hinder years, were big and chunky and they've fallen out of fashion. Kind of like large watches have fallen out of fashion. <clears throat> and it seems to me that their in-house design team atrophied during the years when all ZT models had to have a hot designer's name attached to them. So run them down. You had Onion. <clears throat> you had Hinderer. You had Emerson. And then the, the nail in the coffin of their addiction to famous designers was the Sinkovich years. Those knives sucked. They were just bad designs. Uh, there's lots of theories about why that alliance existed, but it seems like to me in those years, their in-house design team either all left or they forgot how to design a knife because some of their new designs are just hokey. Uh, oh, I forgot about Gus Ciccini. Oh, my. Anyway. <clears throat> so ZT not doing well as far as the used values go. Uh, next, Chris Reeve. Now, I was as concerned as anybody about the old man's exit from the company. I am not a lover of the Savenza 31. I think it's uh, less expensive to make properly than the 21. I think the manufacturing processes are not as precise. I have objective evidence of that. <clears throat> However, Chris Reeve Knives as a brand remains stronger than death as far as used values go. Pristine examples of their models still bring very strong money over retail if they're sold out new. And then their highly optioned offerings, so, you know, the premium wood inlays, the custom graphics, the Damascus bladed models, they do crazy money. Uh, unless they're just like, uh, you know, a design combination that is ugly. <clears throat> they do well. And then, you know, the Omnum's on, which for a year and a half was like, uh, you had to pay blood to get one. They've come back to earth a little bit, but still super strong. Um, next, Emerson. Now, this brand absolutely amazes me. Uh, <laughs> They're still selling 1980s modern folder technology with early 2000s steels, but their knives have a very loyal following and their values have been rock solid in the used market across their whole catalog. Next, Microtech. And their Microtech is interesting. For a brand that has always held its value well, Microtech has slipped a little bit over the past year especially. I think there are a couple reasons for this. First is the advent of the SOCOM Bravo series and other Microtechs, which have been overtly, explicitly made in China. And I think Microtech buyers are smelling a rat. Number one, they don't like it that Microtech is having their knives made in China, especially since they're as expensive or more expensive than their American models. And I think people wonder a little bit in the back of their mind how many Microtech components have been manufactured in China for a long time. I am one of those people. The other reason is, since so many states have legalized automatic knives, more manufacturers have entered that segment. And some of them are making very good knives for a lot less money than Microtech. So bottom line, Microtech isn't that special anymore. Next, well, one of those companies, not, not that they're a new company in the market, but one that makes great auto knives <clears throat> and folders for less money than Microtech in America is ProTech. Um, I don't know if this, if this coincides time-wise with uh, the new facility they moved in a few years ago, but they're making a lot of knives. They continue to innovate. Uh, some of their manual action knives have been very, very popular. The Malibu uh, comes to mind. Their collaboration knives have been outstanding. The Tactical Response Series, 
are amazing. I, I own a TR3 and I love that knife. Um, so values are strong across their catalog, not only their new stuff, but their classic models that they continue to make in new configurations with different materials and colorways. They all sell well. Um, Protect, just a great little company. Okay, next I want to talk about a lump of brands. I will call them lower tier American brands. And I say American brands because most of their knives are made in China. Uh, so specifically, CRKT, Gerber, Kershaw, Ontario now. These brands, with the exception of Kershaw's actual American-made knives, are all in the toilet from a value standpoint, uh, especially CRKT. So uh, I wrote, if you're moving on from these, if you're getting rid of some that you have in your collection, trying to sell them isn't really even worth the aggravation. Just give them to your brother-in-law next Christmas, especially CRKT. Those knives are worthless. Uh, next, on a similar topic, I will call them American <clears throat> and European boutique brands that are made in China. So I'm talking about Pena, X-Series, Jack Wolf. Uh, I'll throw Browse in there because there ain't no brand of knife in the world that has taken as big of a value hit as Browse. They're worth nothing. <laughs> nothing. Mostly because for years, Jason Browse lied about who made his knives. Mm. Uh, also, I'm going to throw Lion Steel into that pool. Why Lion Steel? Well, <clears throat> if you look at a Lion Steel knife, let's use the Kerr, for example. When the Kerr was in production, it may still be, but when it was new, you could go on AliExpress and buy the same knife. And the, there were some details about that knife that no Chinese cloner would do. Uh, the scales, as they approached the body screws, radiused up to like a raised boss. The, the body screws were a rounded corner triangle. The AliExpress knives were too. Now, there's no way a Chinese cloner is going to make that detail in a knife unless, guess what? They're the OEM for that brand. Uh, here's a little piece of supporting evidence for Maniago knives mostly being made in China. Uh, which European country had the highest incidence of COVID? Yeah. Italy was like, uh, they were exponentially higher in COVID cases than other European countries. <clears throat> there are a lot of Chinese people in Italy going back and forth. So anyway, here's my point about these brands. And I'll get away from the European stuff for a minute. I'll talk about brands that are founded by Americans who have never made knives. So Enrique, you're excused from this conversation. Um, they really don't know how to design a knife. They market well. They name their brand something that sounds cool and American. It would A brand that would appeal to guys uh, who live in cities that wear little booties and have flannel shirts and beards with no reason because they don't really ever go out in the cold. They have slick packaging. They have cool social media. And not only have they never made or designed a knife, but they're using a company in China that's never made or designed a knife. And you guys eat that stuff up <clears throat> for about 10 minutes. The knives have no soul. They're Instagram knives. And uh, as, as those of you who were kind of getting into collecting knives when those brands were new, as you have developed maturity as collectors, you've kind of realized, you know, there's really no there there. They have no provenance. They have no soul. And the values used, tumbling. Uh, so we'll move from those brands to what I'll call Highline Chinese brands. We. Uh, well, you guys know over there. We, Reich. Um, 
who's the the brand I'm not thinking of anyway because I, I I really don't care about them. But let's say Chinese knives that are ball bearing flipper titanium frame locks that cost you know two hundred and two hundred to three hundred and fifty dollars new. I'll just tell you right now. If you bought one of those new and you want to send it to me to sell it and it costs two hundred and fifty bucks, it's a hundred and fifty dollar knife if it's like new. Um. There are reasons for that. And it's about intrinsic value. And I'll get to that at the end of the video and then compare it to what I'm saying about the used values of Chinese knives. You'll know what I'm saying. Next, inexpensive Chinese brands. So this would be like Civivi, Artisan, Best Tech, Tucson. <clears throat> Again, if if you think you if you paid ninety five bucks for one of these knives and you think you're going to sell it for eighty, think again. If it's near mint or like new in box, it's worth half what you paid for it. They have no intrinsic value. Um, and whether it's the Highline Chinese knives or the inexpensive Chinese knives, and there will always be a market for inexpensive Chinese knives. And when I say inexpensive, I mean I mean twenty five to forty dollars. <clears throat> there's a reason those knives exist. But there's no reason to pay three digits for a knife that's made by somebody who doesn't even know what a knife does, but he knows how to program a CNC machine and he can hire uh, he can hire 14-year-old slaves to put them together for him. If that, if that gives you pride of ownership, you are becoming rarer and rarer in the market. Next brand, Bark River Knives, still very strong. Very, very strong. Um, the company that has really no peer. Uh, they've been around a long time, over 20 years. They do things nobody else does. You know, they'll make a run. Well, they take, for instance, the Gunny Sidekick I just did with them. 700 knives. And I don't think any two of them had the same handle and fastener configuration. They use great steels. Mike knows, uh, knows how to heat treat. He knows where to get it done. He makes beautiful handles. You know, you know they are all hand finished knives. So there's some variability in them. But Bark River people don't seem to care. So it, I would say this, it's rare, even if a Bark River is sold out, for it to bring more money than it sold for new web retail, but they're very strong, kind of like Benchmade in, in depreciation or used versus new value. Next, Great Eastern Cutlery. I call them the juggernaut of the knife industry when it comes to used values. Even though Bill Howard finally took the advice of those who love him and raised his prices, Still, a used Great Eastern Cutlery, which is sold out new, which means that's been out for more than 10 minutes, <laughs> will do on the used market 100% to 300% of its original web retail. Yeah. The only other brand I think that does this that's kind of a production knife company is Randall Made. And they make fixed blades. And they've been making fixed blades for, gosh, I don't know, 80, 90 years. Um, you'll pay more for a used Randall than you'll pay for a new one. You can buy a new one, you can order it, and it'll get here in six or seven years. So, yeah. Uh, there's some brands, uh, obviously, that I'm leaving out. <clears throat> but those are kind of the, the ones I see a lot of. And if I left one out, you can probably connect the dots. So Next, I want to talk about what I'm calling the rules of intrinsic value. What makes a knife worth money if you're buying it used, if it's if it's in the open market, so to speak. Because you buy it from a retailer, you, if you want it, you pay the price, right? <clears throat> so what makes a knife intrinsically valuable? valuable? The first couple are true of anything that you buy. Scarcity. How hard is it to get your hands on, right? The harder it is to get, the more money it does. Unless nobody wants it, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> Which brings you to the second ingredient, which is desirability. So I wrote, beyond social media trends, this is a huge factor. And it has actually begun to return to the thought process of the knife collector. 
uh, as a key component of the emotional decision to own or collect a particular brand or model. And make no mistake, guys, these knives we're talking about, they're, they're all emotional decisions. None of them make sense. What do you think it really costs Chris Reeve Knife Company to make a Sabenza? A plain Jane Sabenza, 31. That sells for, what is it now? Is it 500 bucks now? Close? Their actual cost of that knife significantly less than 100 bucks, right? Uh, so it just is. So there's no, there's no rational, objective criteria by which you pay Chris Reeve knives for 500 bucks for a Sabenza. So it's an emotional decision to own or collect a particular brand or model. What goes into that emotional decision? And we'll throw out the social media age stuff like, I saw lots of cool pictures on Instagram and I think the guy who posted them is cool. So if I can post some of those cool pictures, that cool knife, that looks great on Instagram, then I'll be cool too. That's not what I'm talking about. So the real stuff in the emotional decision. Who's making it? How is it made? Do we like and appreciate the character of the maker and the story of the knife? Is there a revered history attached to the brand? Those are the intrinsics of desire, desirability. Next, quality. We're talking about materials, machining, fit and finish, which by the way, I've never said this out loud, I think on the channel, but I'm going to now. That does not mean tolerances. It is like fingernails on a chalkboard for me every time I hear a YouTube reviewer talk about how high the tolerances are, are on a particular knife. Because I've never ever seen one of them pull out a blueprint for a knife read a dimension and the plus or minus that's called a tolerance <laughs> you guys who are using that word have no idea what you're talking about a tolerance is something in a specification it must be at least this but not more than this just because of the way a knife feels in your hand and whether or not it has play in it, it has nothing to do <clears throat> with tolerances Next, ergonomics, aesthetics, utility, durability. Those are the aspects of quality, right? Perceived quality. And next, the last thing I think uh, is brand customer service and product support. That means when you got a problem with your knife or it's old and used and you want to freshen it up, when you call or email, somebody at the brand, are they responsive? Are they polite? Do they act like they want to talk to you? I know the two best that I've ever dealt with, and I, I call these guys a lot because I work on your knives too. Not, not only do I sell them to you and help, help you sell them, I also sharpen them and fix them. And uh, The two best, absolutely hands down bar none, are Chris Reeve and Benchmade. I always look forward to talking to Benchmade. I always look forward to talking to Chris Reeve. And I'm not special to them. They kind of know who I am, but they're just delightful. I guess a distant third, and only, I'm only going to say distant because it takes them a long time uh, to handle their stuff. But the best customer service experience from a personal standpoint, actually talking to him, probably Bark River. Um, you know, Mike might make fun of you. He might abuse you a little bit. He might think you're silly and tell you so, but Mike and the people who work for him at Bark River are fun to deal with. Next, will they be there in 15 years? <clears throat> That's what kills me about somebody who pays 400 bucks for a wee knife. <laughs> There's only, there are only a few reasons to spend that kind of money on a knife. And the most important among them are, is it a knife of a lifetime? You know, can I carry this knife for 20 years and before handing it down to my grandson, send it to Boise and it comes back looking like a new Sabenza for not much money. And I know those guys are going to be there to do that. 
Can you do that with your wee knife? Will you be able to do that with your wee knife? They have no relationship with you. They don't care. What they care about is your dollars and destroying American competition for their products, not just in the knife industry, but everything else. If they get a lot of heat on social media because they produced a turd knife that people paid too much money for and everything's coming down on them, they'll just, they will just kill that brand and they'll start another brand with another name that sounds European next week. <clears throat> and you guys will go crazy for that one. Those, I think, are the, the ingredients of intrinsic value. And I'm, I'm not even touching on the classic and antique stuff because I'm on social media talking to you. And let's face it, the market for uh, iconic knives that were made in 1982 doesn't exist on social media. It's what happened in the last 10 minutes. Um, so I'm not really going to get into that too much. How do I know that? Because when I sell absolutely beautiful examples of knives that should have historical value in the knife community, they don't sell. <clears throat> I just sold I just sold a Seki City Japanese made SOG Air Midlock folder. That's a beautiful piece. It should have been worth 80 to 100 bucks. I sold it for $39 after a week. <clears throat> Anywho. So I think that's about all we're talking about today. So in the used market, if you're, if you're, if you are a collector, especially a new collector, and I gave this advice for years and years and years, for those of you who don't know, I used to be before I retired from it and became a knife guy full time. Uh, I used to run car dealerships and I managed new car dealerships. I managed new car departments in new car dealerships, used car departments in new car dealerships. I worked for other people who had independent dealerships that were all used, and I owned a used car dealership at one point. <clears throat> and when people asked me this for this advice, I always gave them the same answer. Should I buy new or should I buy used? Well, if you care about your money, don't buy new. Uh, there are so many new collectors with fleeting tastes. There is always a steady supply of near mint to like new pocket knives <clears throat> that you can buy in various venues for far less than you will pay Blade HQ or GP knives or even knife ship free. And they're the same knife. And let's face it, if you have 50 knives in your collection, you're not using any of them enough to wear it out, wear them out. So it doesn't really matter if you bought it two months after somebody bought it new at all. <clears throat> now there is something, if it's a really special knife, there's something to being the, the one who bought it new. I get that. Um, I do get it. I have a Sebenza that I wouldn't have bought anyway, but new. But the used market is the place to go right now if, you're, uh, if your money is important to you. Because used values versus new prices are at a low point in the last 15 years, I think. So I don't know if any of that helps, um, but it's been percolating in my brain for a long time. I just needed to get it out to you. So I did. Well, that is all for this one. Grace to you and peace, my friends. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, remember, the word is sharp. I'll talk to you soon.